Did you know that out of the current top five grossing films of all time, only Titanic is outside the science fiction genre? Science fiction isn't just popular. It's central to the history of film in North American culture itself. The move to narrative filmmaking, which defines cinema as we know it today, is widely associated with the work of Georges Méliès around the turn of the 20th century. Méliès, an illusionist saw the potential of film for creating special effects. He experimented with this new technology through a series of fantastical tales. His most influential film, A Trip to the Moon, depicts a group of astronauts traveling to the moon, exploring its surface, baffling its inhabitants, and returning to Earth, all within 15 minutes. This short film pushed the boundaries of what was possible for the medium and shaped the future of cinema. What's remarkable is that A Trip to the Moon came out in 1902, 67 years before Neil Armstrong took one giant leap for mankind. This is an example of how scientific achievements are often first imagined in the realm of fiction. Edward Lerner, physicist, computer scientist, science fiction and techno thriller novelist, deconstructs the science behind the fiction and the intriguing connections between scientific fact and its influence on science fiction within Western culture. Join us as we get rebelliously curious. Edward, thank you so much for joining me on Rebelliously Curious today. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. So I'm a huge science fiction fan, as a lot of people are, people that talk about science or technology. And I just the general person, I think, loves science fiction. So you've been coined. Well, first of all, you're a physicist, a computer scientist, and you're an author who's developed the science behind the fiction. So you this has been coined, this term, science behind the fiction. Can you talk to me a little bit about how that started and your background um, becoming an author? Okay, I'll start very early with the science part of uh, that trend. I grew up during the uh, first space race. So things like Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin and uh, John Shepard. Is it John? I forgot his first name. Regard Alan, Alan Shepard. Yeah, those things were formative for me. Uh, there was never any question in my mind that I would do something with science. I wound up uh, going into physics, and physics was great. Uh, in my senior year uh, studying physics, I took a computer course and uh, never looked back. I just loved working in computers, and that led to a 30-year career working in a bunch of high-tech companies like Bell Labs and Hughes Aircraft. Still, 30 years doing anything is a long time. And uh, partway through that interval, I started writing science fiction as a hobby. When I sold my second novel in 2004, which meant the first one was not a fluke, I made the jump to full-time author. Now, to uh, go full circle, after I'd been writing for a while, I happened to write a nonfiction article for the magazine Analog Science Fiction and Fact on the subject of communications in science fiction and questions like how would aliens communicate? How would we communicate with them if we ran across one another? It was a very well-received article, so I thought, what the heck, I'll do another one. And I did one on possible science behind faster than light travel. That won an award as the best science article in the magazine for a year. So I kept on doing it on different topics of science commonly used in science fiction and eventually realized, my gosh, there's, there are enough of these things piling up. I'm approaching book length. And that resulted in the book, Troping the Light Fantastic, the science behind the fiction, which is a play both on an old uh, 
song title, Tripping the Light Fantastic, and the notion of faster than light travel, which all science fiction fans are enamored of. Yeah, it's such a great beginning. I have to go back because anybody who watches the show and listens to the show knows that I love UAPs and the concept of UFOs. I want to go back to the essay, the piece that you wrote about communication with extraterrestrials and what that potentially would be like. Can you give me an idea of what you were writing in that piece? Sure. There's so much we don't know about aliens never having met them. Fair. So do they communicate with sound and audible speech like we do? Well, maybe. Do they communicate with light? Uh, that certainly seems possible, modulate light. Uh, do they use radio waves? Do they use uh, the functional equivalent of uh, sign language? Do they communicate chemically like uh, some insects do? You know, ants laying down pheromone trails so that uh, workers can follow the scouts. So just exploring all of the possible communication media was part of that first article. Another part of the article was looking at uh, variability in language. If you just look at human languages, there is a lot of variability. If you study foreign languages, you quickly discover that different languages have different number of tenses. Some languages have uh, gender associated with inanimate objects. Uh, which is a really weird concept to me, but you know, German and Spanish to name two have that, you know, why a table would have a gender is a mystery to me, but someone chose it. Um, then the third part of this article dealt with the question of, we have nothing in common with these aliens. Uh, so what is, uh, what is the approach by which we can find a way to communicate? It's all well and good to say we can receive their signals and they can receive our signals, but it's not like our language has evolved from a common root. When uh, it, ancient Egyptian was finally cracked, it was because someone found the Rosetta Stone, which used hieroglyphics and uh, Greek and people knew how to speak Greek, so they could, uh, so they made the assumption that the Egyptian was saying the same thing and that enabled the translation. So it's a very messy problem how we could communicate with someone with whom we have nothing in common. Okay, now the spoiler. We do have something in common. We live in the same universe. Our laws of physics and their laws of physics are presumably the same. Our mathematics and their mathematics presumably are the same. And uh, that commonality is something we can perhaps build from. That gives me a segue to one of the series of novels I've written called Interstellar Net. And at the beginning of Interstellar Net, which as you might expect from the name has to do with interstellar radio communications, uh, there's a significant portion of the novel that is dealing with how we can start from very simple commonalities like arithmetic to uh, make it possible to recognize pictures and then use pictures in a transmission stream to decode further commonalities. Eventually, once enough commonalities are developed and uh, a simple language is shared in common, the communication between humans in our solar system and aliens and other solar systems gets much more sophisticated and the story goes in another direction, but this is a long enough answer already. <laughs> no, I love that. That's fantastic. I would hope that things like binary code and you're right, mathematics and physics and things that we know that um, hopefully, are, hopefully are universal or that we'd be able to communicate with them. Now, looking at science fiction, how do we keep the science fact in science fiction? I wish uh, it were there more often now. Me too. Uh, I, I frequently see things on TV or movies where the science is just abominable 
and I watch more to uh, be amused than for the plot line. But of course, there is also lots of great science fiction out there with good science. And I like to think that's what I write. Uh, there are other authors uh, who I very much respect who have very good uh, science in their fiction. Uh, I'll name a couple. Jeff Landis, who's currently working at NASA, who doesn't have enough time to write as much fiction as I would appreciate, uh, has a great book set on Mars called uh, Mars Crossing, which is, is very realistic. Alan Smale wrote a book called Hot Moon, and Alan is recently retired from a different branch of NASA. This is probably a good time to mention that I was a NASA contractor for seven years, so I won't claim quite as much knowledge as these guys have because they they were lifers or are lifers at uh, NASA, but uh, I had my share. How can we keep that kind of science and science fiction? It's up to the readers and the viewers. If that's what they buy and that's what they watch, that's what authors will write and uh, hopefully Hollywood will produce. I hope so. We need that. I I think in some films it's getting better, like or it it's becoming better. I would say Christopher Nolan does a really great job at that. But you are right; there's television that is just horrible. I would say at putting science fact into science fiction. Can you give me some examples that you've seen outside of just people that you know? For example, in film and television, where you feel that the science was really practical and it was achievable when you saw something that was in science fiction. And it could even be something that happened in the past. It doesn't even have to be present where that was a science fiction idea, but it became you know, science reality. Well, one recent example would be the Apple TV series for all mankind. That's an alternate history where the Soviets did not uh, forfeit the space race and actually got to the moon a couple months ahead of us. And then the U.S. and the Soviets engaged in a long-term space race instead of what, of course, happened, which was we declared victory and stayed home for the next 50 years. So there's uh, excellent science in, uh, in that series. It, it gets a little bit uh, fast and loose by season four, but it's really one of the better examples. Another good example is Andy Weir's book and the movie made from it, The Martian. The, the physics and the computer engineering and the communications in that are excellent. My one quibble with that book is that uh, our hero survives after strand, being stranded on Mars by growing potatoes in Mars dirt. And Mars mm -hmm. dirt is full of peroxides and perchlorates, which are highly toxic. The potatoes wouldn't have made it. Oh, that's interesting. When uh, I wrote my own Mars book, which is Life and Death on Mars, which was published just uh, last December, I had my explorers on Mars using hydroponics, which is growing plants directly in water, you just add the nutrients, or aeroponics, which is the plants are rooted in air and you just mist uh, their roots. So either of those is probably a lot more practical than trying to detoxify the Martian dirt. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And we're seeing that China and even NASA is looking to grow plants. I believe that China, I think this was about three years ago, did grow a, a type of plant. I forget exactly what it was, but it ended up dying like a day or two later. But they did, you know, have some form of growth. So, you know, it's very science fiction that's turned science fact as well. Growing plants uh, in a space station, I think is harder than growing it on the moon or Mars would be because in, uh, in orbit, in free fall, the, the plants have no sense of direction. And that's another variable. I mean, the gravity is weaker on those other uh, astronomical bodies, but there's definite up and down. In your experience, has the evolution of science fact and science fiction shaped our Western culture over the years? Well, in recent years, uh, the biggest trend uh, that I see is rejection of science rather than embracing of science. 
And the anti-vax movement, as an example, is certainly an instance of that. The, the track record of vaccinations is so positive, and yet so many people increasingly disbelieve it. I think more people are embracing the possibility that space travel and even limited space exploitation will happen. When you have people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos spending billions of their personal fortunes uh, to have space companies, it's hard not to take it seriously that something will happen. I think hopefully over time it should. And I hopefully think that people, so. yeah. And I think people are more optimistic, I would say about the space race. You know, we have some scary things happening within space defense right now, but we have on the other side, on this positive side, we see all of this new uh, space exploration that's happening with Elon Musk and Bezos, you know? So I think that hopefully we'll have an, uh, a space where we're able to in the, in the future come where that science fiction really became, you know, science fact at some point in time. I would like space tourism to uh, be a little bit more affordable. No, I would, no I would how much love I that. dig in my sofa for small change. It's not enough. I would love that. You're right. I've looked forward to the day. I've always said that my dad said to me, if he ever passes and he obviously can't go to the moon, he said, Chrissy, can you bring, you know, bring a picture of me? And I said, dad, I'll do better. I said, if I get to go to the moon or any form of space uh, exploration, I said, I'll bring a flag with your face on it. <laughs> so <laughs> plant it in the moon or just bring it up with me. Um, because I, you know, it's something that I think for multiple generations, and I hope he does get to see that or maybe even get to experience it later in his life. But I think it's something a lot of us science fiction fans or even just the average person would love to experience that before uh, moving on to maybe another life or something else. Here, here. I want to break down what is a trope with you. Okay. In literature, a trope is basically language use other than literally, or language use symbolically. So a simple example would be, you know, metaphor or simile, or words used as shorthand for complicated concepts. So uh, I live in uh, the Washington DC area, and people use foggy bottom as shorthand for a, a whole area in the city where the State Department is, and then by extension, it became shorthand for the State Department. Trivial examples. A uh, more complex example is some standard uh, formats in literature, like quests and uh, heroes. And as soon as you know a story has a quest, it conveys a whole lot of information to you that doesn't have to be told explicitly. You have some expectations. Okay, so if a generic trope is language used other than literally, in my mind, a science fiction trope is science used other than literally. So in science fiction literature, we have concepts like time travel and faster than light travel that we don't know how to implement and we're not 100% certain uh, they're even possible, but we go ahead and use them anyhow and it's a convenient shorthand and it's foundational to an awful lot of science fiction, both literary and visual. So back to my series of articles that became the book Basically every chapter or for complex topics, uh, two chapters would be on one of these science fictional shorthands. Okay, so Albert Einstein, uh, who we all still respect, said that uh, no information can travel faster than light. Right. And anything uh, with information, there is a loophole that says things that carry no information, so they do no good for you to have them travel faster than light can travel faster than light, but nothing with information, which would include people. 
it turns out there are some interesting loopholes in general relativity, like the possibility of wormholes, not that we know those exist. And uh, if there were wormholes, if there were uh, additional dimensions beyond the four we're familiar with that could represent shortcuts, there are some interesting speculative forms of science that would enable us to have the effect of traveling faster than light. Uh, generically, I just call them short, shortcuts or warp drives. So uh, one of the, the articles, one of the chapters in the book became reviewing all of these forms of speculative, but nonetheless respectable science so even though faster than light travel is pretty much just a trope, science used other than literally when we use it in fiction, maybe there's something there. Uh, I think we all remember that uh, some of the gadgets used in early science fiction, like you know, Dick Tracy's uh, watch phone or Star Trek communicators, were fictional at the time, but now we all carry such gadgets with us. Uh, I mention that because sometimes these tropes like portable communicators become real science and maybe a trope like warp drive will eventually inspire someone to find a real life shortcut through an extra dimension, which will give us the effect of faster than light travel. And wouldn't that be nice? Oh, it'd be fantastic. I've spoken to people that I've worked on or working on a theory right now. I've spoken to two, two people uh, that are looking at working at warp drive theory. And it's, you know, it's so Star Trek. It's so fantastical, mm -hmm. but it's exciting. And right now it's a theory, but they might make it into a possibility. And I hope I get to see that one day. I think a lot of people would love to see that. There are some very interesting speculative but uh, reputable theories that uh, could lead to uh, faster than light travel. The other snag, besides we have to prove one or more of those is actually real science, not speculative. Right. Is they're all energy intensive. I mean, the only reason you want faster than light travel really is to travel across light years to another star. And basic considerations of just conservation of energy and uh, how the mass of an object that's moving fast increases, that's more Einstein. You need prodigious amounts of energy. So we need uh, much better means of uh, fueling a spacecraft than anything we have right now. That's a very good point. And I think we're always looking for obviously different forms of energy. It's important for us on planet and off planet. Fusion has been, nuclear fusion has been the energy of the future for 50 years and always will be. But I don't really think that. I'm hoping it'll eventually happen. It does seem like we're inching closer and closer to practical fusion. And that would solve so very many problems if we were to have it both on Earth and enabling much farther ranging space travel. Uh, it'd be unbelievable if we, when we learn how to really harness fusion. How does this book serve as a resource to science fiction writers? Well, it, it very much is that. And in fact, one of my favorite blurbs for the book is from science fiction author Rob Sawyer, who's won just about every science fiction award imaginable. And I won't get it word for word, but he called it something like the indispensable resource for science fiction writers. Whereas I very much like and appreciate that blurb, I prefer to think of the book as the in indispensable resource for science fiction readers and viewers, much larger audience. And you talk about using humor in the book and how does humor work when you're explaining, you know, science fiction or even looking towards science fact tropes? A lot of concepts can get very uh, intricate and complicated to explain. And if uh, the explanation gets too wonky, too fast, uh, you lose your audience. 
there was a, a famous nuclear physicist in uh, the 1930s, uh, George Gamow, who said something like, and this is politically incorrect, but this was the 1930s, no theory is worth a damn that can't be explained to a barmaid. Very 1930s, and, but I see where it's going, right? Yeah. And the point, the, the larger point, aside from the uh, the political incorrectness of it all, right. is explain physically what's going on. Don't get lost in the mathematics and make it interesting. Okay, so... Uh, this is a challenge, not just for writing popular science, but very much also for writing science fiction, which is you know the largest part of my output. You can't just have page after page after page of description. It's got to be dispensed in bite-sized chunks. It's got to be made interesting. Humor is one of the tools to make it interesting. So analogies and sometimes silly but valid analogies are, are very helpful. I think so too. I love that you use humor and that you state that. I think it's really important, especially when breaking down really hard concepts. The one thing I love about science and technology and, and all of these areas is the fact that you can get really wrapped into a theory and I don't would never know how to do the practical science. Let's be honest, my brain doesn't work that way. I'm a communicator, but I like the theories in science and I find them fun to talk about and, and to just think deeper in with people. You don't, and I think this is really important for people to know is that you don't have to be a scientist and your brain doesn't have to work in a scientifically um, mechanical way. You can still have really wonderful ideas and break down wonderful hard concepts and think deeper in them without being able to do the practical aspect of it. Um, and I think that's what the fun part about science is, and we forget to put fun back into it. It's also one of the fun aspects of scientifically accurate science fiction. It's a fun way to learn the concepts. When I was a kid, some of my favorite reading reading was the Robert Heinlein juvenile science fiction novels. And boy, talk about uh, an enjoyable way to learn some basic science and learn some concepts about space travel. Dr. Michael Masters wrote a novel too, a fictional novel uh, about UFOs and uh, this one man who's an anthropologist ends up getting abducted, but he's there to help the planet. It's totally like a fictional based novel. And there's, and there's obviously way more to it, but I love the fact because it's rooted with a whole bunch of different scientific terms. It's rooted all, not all of it, but a lot of it as much as he could possibly get in there as an anthropologist, mm -hmm. it's put into the book. So you're really learning, uh, going along and learning while you're having this really wonderful, fun exploration and story that's coming from such a beautiful mind. And so I, I really enjoy that. And I feel that that's hopefully where more of our science fiction will lead towards is having science fact always embedded embedded into it, along with our film and television and the rest of our you know cultural element, Western cultural elements. I'm on board with everything you described, but I also enjoy and produce science fiction, which is set uh, well into the future and consistent with one of Arthur Clarke's laws, you know, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable for magic. Yes. Some of the technology in far future science fiction tends to be on the hand wavium side. But even when the technology is hand wavy, I'm insistent that it be used consistently and make sense. So even very imaginative and imaginary science can be used in a, in a rigorous scientific method sort of way. For sure. I agree with you. We, we're never going to get rid of futurism. Uh, never, ever. But you're right. We don't want to we don't want to lose the fantastical. I would never, ever want to lose that. That's the best part of, I think, of science fiction, too. I spend a lot of my time reading it and writing it. That's awesome. Edward, thank you so much for joining me today on Rebelliously Curious. And yeah, thank you for being rebelliously curious with me. My today. pleasure.